When family gets together, it seems like all our funniest stories start with, remember when mom did this, like the times she embarrassed you in front of your friends or caught you doing things you weren't supposed to do. Well, this Mother's Day, celebrate mom and all the joy and laughter she brings with a gorgeous bouquet from 1-800-Flowers.com. Right now, 1-800-Flowers is giving our listeners an exclusive 36 for 36 offer. That's 36 sorbet roses for just $36. That's only a dollar per rose. Simply pick your delivery date and let 1-800-Flowers handle the rest. Stunning sorbet rose is the perfect way to surprise all the moms in your life, your wife, your aunt, your sister, your mother. It's a refreshing mix of pastel shades in pink and orange and lavender, guaranteed to make her smile. 36 sorbet roses for only $36. It's an amazing offer, but it expires Friday. Every bouquet is backed by 1-800-Flowers, 100% smile guarantee. So right now, order 36 sorbet roses for just $36 by going to 1-800-Flowers.com, click the radio icon, and enter the code MIKE. That's 1-800-Flowers.com, enter the code MIKE, and hurry, the offer ends Friday. Hi, it's Greeny, and you know what? You deserve a break. Enjoy a delicious Reason Chewy Chocolate Caramel and get ready to celebrate. Reason has teamed up with ESPN to give you and a guest a VIP trip to the ESPY Awards in L.A. It's the reason to party at the ESPY's sweepstakes. You could walk the red carpet, attend the awards show, and even enjoy exclusive post-party access, giving you a reason to dust off that tux. Details on ESPN.com backslash reason, that's R-I-E-S-E-N. And remember, for double chocolate indulgence that lasts and lasts, all you need is one good reason. No purchase necessary. See ESPN.com slash reason. Here we are, back in Better Than Ever, presented by Progressive Insurance and our guests on the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. On this travel day for Mike and Mike, we're off to Philly after the show today. NFL Draft begins tomorrow night. Intrigue at the very top, Golik, as one team tries to do the impossible, have its cake, and eat it too. Mm -hmm. And I know what you're thinking. Yeah. I know what you're wondering. I know that you, like I, heard me say that and immediately started wondering... Where exactly did that idiomatic proverb come from? The idea of having your cake and eating it too and not being able to do that. Where did that originate? Well, first and foremost, I don't think it's an idiotic proverb. It's I a, think it's it, a it's very an, cool it an, proverb. It's an idiomatic Oh, idiomatic proverb. Oh, Correct. not idiotic. No, no. It is. It is. It, it presents an idiom ah. and it is a proverb. So it's an idiomatic proverb. It is ah. not an idiotic Well, now proverb. I understand. No, idiotic <laughs> proverbs are yeah. more... Um, I don't idiotic. Know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One way or another, mm -hmm. I, I bet you're wondering, I know you're wondering, you were thinking to yourself, you know, we've got all this NFL draft to cover. Right, right, right. We've got all these NBA playoffs to get into. This guy, Thames, just keeps hitting home runs. We've got to figure out who he is. Mm -hmm. He says he's got plenty of blood and urine, so we're not going to worry about getting drug tested. No, anymore. he's not. All this stuff is going on, but the minute Greeny says, can't have your cake and eat it too, you're wondering, where did that expression come from? I really was. Now, two things that you went third person, uh, and also about having my cake and eating it too. I looked it up. Yeah. And it started, the first known usage of it was in a letter written March 14th, 1538. 1538. From Thomas, the Duke of Norfolk, to Thomas Cromwell. And here's the interesting thing about it. From that point until the 1930s, it was commonly used in the reverse. So people would say, you cannot eat your cake and have it to. And if you think about it, that makes a lot more sense. It actually makes you understand what the proverb means, which is to say, if you're going to eat the cake, you don't have it anymore. Somehow we switched it in the last 80 years to you can't have your cake and eat it to. And that actually makes less sense and makes it confusing. Well, it does, because normally when you have a cake, you're going to eat it. Right. Yeah. So the point is, now when you hear it in the reverse, you understand what you mean. If you're going to eat it, you won't have it anymore. It's true. And so I would like to start a movement. In fact, perhaps we could put together a committee. And if you have the time, you could share that committee. If there's cake involved, I'll be on the committee. Well, how could there not be cake? The well, entire depends focus. on how you're going at it. If I, it well, here's I, the point. Yeah. At the committee, you can have your cake. Okay. <laughs> then I can eat it and as well. And you can eat okay. it too. Okay. Then so I'll be on the committee. That is where that idiomatic proverb came from. Okay, that's great to know. Now, what does it have to do with? Uh, it has to do with the Cleveland Browns, ah. who may, right, are still, you're going to hear Mary Kay Cabot in the next three oh, minutes. No, don't. Tell you that they are very seriously considering taking Mitchell Trubisky at number one in this draft. Oh, the, the, the smirking that goes on. But the likelier scenario yeah. is that they will take Miles Garrett and they will make sure they trade up to get him. And thus, mm -hmm. they will have their cake. There you go. And they will eat it okay, too. Okay, okay. It all tied together nicely. As was first written in 1538. Off the top. But let's start the off top. the top, Mike. Russell Westbrook had a Russell Westbrook kind of night. 47 points, 11 rebounds, 9 assists. But what did it add up to? It added up to them being out of the playoffs. They lose that series 4-1 to the Houston Rockets. The Rockets, Russell Westbrook was off the floor for six minutes. 
In those six minutes, the Rockets outscored the Thunder 27-9. So in total, for this series, Russell Westbrook on the court, plus 15. Russell Westbrook off the court, minus 58. Do we think anybody got to Steven Adams after the game and was able to ask him that question of why they struggle when Russell Westbrook is off the court? But the bottom line is, he's going to be the MVP But the Houston Rockets are the better team. The Houston Rockets, by the way, with uh, Harden on the court were plus 19. With Harden off the court, they were plus 24. They're a better team than Oklahoma City. And the symmetry of what Russell Westbrook did this year, the second uh, triple-double average through the season, uh, through the year, Big O did it, Oscar Robertson, in 1962. In that year, uh, Oscar Robertson's team lost in the first round, only had one win as well. So there's your symmetry. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times one person is putting up those kind of numbers because he's kind of alone out there. So one thing we can say, they had their cake, but they were not allowed to eat it, too. (laughs) Off the top. top. Next, the Spurs beat the Grizz by 13. They're up three games to two in that series. Yeah, and uh, when when they get 2-2, Popovich has been pretty good. Uh, Actually, in in this series, uh, the home teams all through the year and the playoffs, home team has won them all in this one, but Popovich... When a series is tied 2-2, two to two, he is 6-0 and all time in those game five. So uh, they get it done. Uh, Kawhi Leonard gets it done yet again. Memphis has done a great job getting into this series. They've been fun to watch with Conley and what Gasol has done and what this team can do. It's always that team you say, boy, there's that tough team, that tough team, but they're looking to crack that next level. Uh, they're not going to do it against San Antonio, but they certainly may, had made it a series. Conley's one of my favorite yeah. players in the league to watch. He's fun. To, he's a really and, good and player. He took so much grief, obviously, of being the highest paid player. L- and listen, that, that's ridiculous to do because it's out there, it's offered to you, you take it. Yeah. You you know what you also do is you, you laugh at everybody mocking you as you're emptying your, your money into the bank and, oh, by the way, playing pretty well. And being the highest paid player is really just a function of timing. Exactly right. He's a max worthy player, in my opinion. Uh, there are a lot of players who made a whole lot of money last year that I laughed at. He was not one of them. Off the top. Uh, what the else? Top. Eric Thames. I mean, it's gotten to a point now where you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is ask, did Eric Thames hit another home run? And every single day, the answer is yes. He hit another home run. He has 11 this month, eight home runs against the Reds, eight against the Reds. So he's the first player in modern uh, baseball since 1900 to homer in each of his first six career games against an opponent as well. Most home runs in one month versus one team in history. Four guys have done eight in a month. But it was uh, in the month of April. Thames has tied one Willie Stargell uh, as far as the month of April. He does have 11 homers this month. The record for April home runs is 14, tied by a couple of guys you'll know. Albert Pujols in 2006, Alex Rodriguez in 2007. And everybody's saying, what is Thames doing? What's he on? You know, is he taking the PEDs? He's been tested three times already this year, including after last night's game. His quote? If people keep thinking I'm on stuff, I'll be here every day. I have a lot of blood and urine, which is good to know. <laughs> Off the top. I like that quote, too. I did too. Uh, Trey Turner hit for the cycle uh, in the Nationals' win over the Rockies, and I love this stat yeah. about cycles at Coors Field. Boy, isn't that the truth? So at Coors Field, it's the 16th cycle hit at Coors Field, second most of any active ballpark, one behind Fenway. So you got to be like, wow, all right, <laughs> Coors Field, 16. Uh, cycles hit there, 17 at Fenway. Fenway opened 83 years earlier yeah. than Coors Field. And they've I mean, had one more cycle, yeah. and no other ballpark has as many. Really, really just amazing. He's the second shortstop in baseball history with seven-plus RBIs in a cycle. The other, Troy Tulowitzki. I like this one. Became the eighth player in Major League history to drive in seven or more runs in a game while hitting for the cycle. The only other player that did it at a younger age, Joe DiMaggio. Back in 1937. Off the top. And finally, speaking of baseball, it's all anybody's been talking about since the middle of the day yesterday. A group led by Jeb Bush, the former governor of Florida, and Derek Jeter, the king of the world, (laughs) appears to be on the verge of becoming the new ownership of the Miami Marlins. So we'll talk plenty about that side of it. Can we talk about the Jeffrey Loria side of it for a moment? Why not? Okay, I understand... Here's it's not the it's pretty simple math, okay? And I think you can even understand. Now you know, this. math is not my forte. You don't have to do anything. I got a pencil. You don't need it. In 1999, Jeffrey Loria bought a stake in the Montreal Expos for 12 million dollars. Okay, 12 million. 
In 2002, Major League Baseball took over the Expos and paid Loria, paid him $120 million to take over the the Marlins. He didn't pay a single dollar out of pocket to complete that ownership transfer, okay? All right, so he's up $108 million right there. There you go. And he's about to sell the Marlins for $1.3 billion. <laughs> Good on you, mate. Oh, my God. I, are you kidding me? That's the greatest transaction in the history of sports. That genuinely is. You know, oh, I sort of remembered that story, but I didn't remember the numbers. Here's the thing. We, our show started, you and I, in 2000. If yeah. we had known each other in 1999 and could have scraped up $12 million to buy a stake in the Expos, Think we, of where we could have been. We'd be billionaires now. I'd be living on, an on island. your island. I'd yes, have you would. my island. You would. Oh my God! <laughs> that's really top. well done. Thanks, All right, for those well stories. done. Yeah, good job, Mike. And Mike presented Unreal. by that's off the top presented by Progressive Insurance. Last year, over three million drivers switched to Progressive. Call it click today. Find out if you could save. I did not see those numbers. I spent the entire day focused yesterday on Derek Jeter. Oh, I went the other way. We got a lot of time to talk about Jeter and the owner. We got you know Jeffrey Laurie as he rides off into the sunset. <laughs> I mean, it's you, ridiculous. I mean, it's it's inc- it's absolutely incredible. Yeah, he actually went to Northwestern for for. Uh, th- well, that's, there you go. Yeah. You know what he did? He just jumped a lot of people in the line of of, of good uh, seats. Uh, uh, yeah, it's exactly. <laughs> He'll be sitting in the seats in front of mine that, at the and, next game. That and when you get to when you Google famous alum, oh, he yeah. just moved up a whole lot of spaces. Certainly wealthiest alum. <laughs> uh, he moved up past a bunch of different people. Anyway, um, so all that is out there and good, and we can talk plenty about cheater later today because if you want to make a list, I, you know. If you are fortunate enough to get to a point, I hope everyone reaches this point. Like when you're young, you think to yourself, I'd like to be that person. I'd like to be that person. And then and I know you share this belief with me that you get to a point in your life where you wouldn't trade places with anybody. I right. wouldn't trade my life, my family, right. my kids, yep. nothing. But if I had to, <laughs> if I had to, I'm not sure Derek Jeter wouldn't be the person you would trade lives with. Who yeah. has it going on better than that guy? Uh, let does? me tell you, and we have really, you know, documented a whole lot of things that have gone on. And, and if you don't know what we're talking about, just Google Derek Jeter and go through the history of him. But off the field, forget, but, but forget. One of the great things I like, I love when the guys stay in the game. And we see guys today because of the money they make. It's not to go into coaching a lot of times. It's to go into GM, presidency, or ownership of teams. But Derek Jeter can offer so much to younger players, to players that want to learn from guys who have been there and done it the right way. You can't, and, and I know as far as talk show hosts and talk shows are concerned, Derek Jeter didn't give you what you wanted to talk about, but Derek Jeter, as far as I'm concerned, did exactly what you're supposed to do. You keep the clubhouse right. You be that guy in the clubhouse. You don't give up anything from the clubhouse. That's, that's the way you do it. He did it right, and he can really pass on a lot of that to younger players on how to carry yourself because it's one thing to get drafted into or be on a professional team. That doesn't make you a professional yet. You have to go through a process there, and he's really a guy that can help a lot of young players with that. Derek Jeter did the impossible. Derek Jeter was a superstar and a matinee idol in New York City yeah. for 20 years and stayed above the fray every day of it. It's incredible. It, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know that anyone else has done that. He made $265 million, by the way, during his playing career, second most of any player ever behind Alex Rodriguez. Um, and so he's got money, and, and you know, 265 at, at that level is nothing. The Bush family yeah. has a lot more money and, and than that. And he'll continue to drop down that list. Stanton already signed the bigger deal, and, and Harper and the guys yeah. will go. Going that. forward, so all these other guys will yeah. make more money than, right. than he uh, made. They, you're right. Their contracts are bigger. They right. haven't gotten all of it yet. Not yet, right. Um, but, but so, point well taken. But either way, the point of it is, like, I, I just respect the heck out of that yeah. guy. I don't know Derek yeah. Jeter at all. Like, I've been in the same room with him once or twice. Um, but to have, for the most part, remained completely above the fray as he has um, through all the stuff that he's done, it, next to impossible to do, and he's managed it. And he had an incredible career, and he's gone on to this, this Players' Tribune thing, Players which has Tribune turned into a real thing. Really turned into a fantastic thing. And now he's going to own the Marlins. Yeah. I mean, you know, with, with, and co-own them with, like, a member of the Bush yeah. family. Yeah. It, it, the, the whole thing is it, it's impossible to believe. It really is, but I'm very happy that, that a guy like that stays part of the game, as I said, for the in- influence not only can have on those players, but maybe in baseball overall as an owner being a part.
part of those owners and having influence when you're talking to the uh, the commissioner and things like that. So that's a great thing for right. baseball. I was going to get to all the draft stuff here, yep. but I also want to get in the Russell Westbrook stuff. And since we have Mark Schlereth coming in 15 minutes, why don't we go through Russell sure. Westbrook's yeah. season first? And we'll reverse the order of that. We're going to be in the draft uh, in Philly at the draft today, uh, tomorrow and Friday. We're leaving today. The tomorrow and Friday we're broadcasting live in Philadelphia. That'll be brought to you by ZipRecruiter.com. Try it for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash Mike. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Mike. Chicken and Pete's, crab fries. We will be oh. there tomorrow and Friday. That, that will bring back memories because yeah. when the season that we did arena football games mm-hmm. on ESPN, which was something in the neighborhood of 2008. Um, we got to know Philadelphia well. We basically became the Philadelphia Souls hometown announcers. We did. We, did. we, we, we probably did six or seven games yeah. there, and we would do our show from Chickie and Pete mm-hmm. every single day that we had uh, had done the game. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah, so well, that'll be yeah, fun the next few days. Now, and Shefty is already at it this morning. He's tweeting. Adam Schefter tweeted, sounds like the Titans are at it again, mm-hmm. already have received offers for a fifth overall pick and are contemplating trade per league source. It's going to be active, right? Mm-hmm. Clearly what's happening here, I was making my joke at the beginning about having your cake and eating it too. The Browns are doing what they want to do and what you're telling them to do. They, they know they have to take Miles Garrett, yes. number one. And they really want the quarterback. They really want him. So they're figuring out a way to get that done. Exactly right. They're, or where they're going to have to jump to. It, it, but what's interesting is you hear more and more that the Jets don't want to take a quarterback. But is that just smoke as well? So maybe the Browns wouldn't make that move and wouldn't try and jump in front of them. And then the Jets would take a quarterback. That's the tough thing to decipher right now, this close to the draft, is what's true and what's not true. But... If you're Cleveland, and, and, and again, this is separate what from our, you know, my personal opinion on the way to go and, and with these quarterbacks, but as we've always said, if you want a guy, if you think he is the guy, then you've got to find a way to get him. And they are they absolutely trying to do that, that statement of have your cake and eat it too because they're going to take Garrett number one. I know Mary Kay Cabot has talked about they're still thinking about Trubisky, and that's from above Hugh Jackson there. They're really wanting to compl- uh, contemplate that. I don't think there's any way that's happening. And then you find out a way to get in the position you need to be in if you really want that quarterback. So, again, we will go through all of that in just a few minutes when Mark Schlereth gets here. Let's take these minutes mm-hmm. to pay tribute to one of the greatest seasons of all time. Um, you know, the NBA regular season is one that we've had a million debates over it, and I know I'm much more upset about some of the stuff that happened this year than right, you were. Right. And a lot of people agree with me, and a lot of people agree with you, and, and that all is what it is. Mm-hmm. But what I think we can all agree on is that Russell Westbrook made this season fantastic. Yes, he did. His, not just with his numbers. The numbers were spectacular. But the numbers were a product of a guy who plays like there's an old character in the, um, in the, in the cartoons like the Tasmanian yes, Devil. Yes, he does, right? He's just out there running around at all times like his hair is on fire, playing as hard hard as you can play, and I, for one, who get frustrated at times with an NBA regular season that feels so meaningless, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate the fire and the spirit and the enthusiasm with which that guy played. So as his season comes to an end yesterday, let's pay tribute, man. That was one great year. It was an incredible year, and and the the talk all year had been with some people go hard, and I was thinking the Harden way for the MVP, and you, I know, were Westbrook, and it obviously doesn't matter what you and I think. We don't have a vote. I do believe Westbrook is going to win it. Again, they have the, the award show on June 26th, so we still won't know for a while. But what did he do? Became the second player in, in NBA history, obviously, to average that triple-double. Set NBA single-season record with the 42 triple-doubles. Recorded three 50-point triple-doubles in the regular season, more than any other player has in their entire career. First player in NBA playoff history with 50-point triple-double third player in NBA history to average a triple-double in a single playoff as well. So in this playoff, he, he averaged that. The others were Jason Kidd in 07, and, of course, Oscar Robertson back in 1962 did it as well. He's been incredible. He has been incredible, and, and unfortunately, it was a great regular season to watch him, but now when the season gets more intense and, and the better part of the season hits us of who's going to be the champion, he's nowhere to be found. He just doesn't have the team. So as I mentioned before, he another thing he has in common with Oscar Robertson is, is the year the Big O averaged a triple-double. He lost in the first round, and his team had one win. So they're out of the playoffs. You don't get to watch him anymore, and we move on. And we just wait till he's announced the MVP, and then we wait and see, does he sign his deal of this offseason where he can sign for $209 million? There's all kind of money ramifications for him to sign now, for him to wait, what he's going to do. Will he be in that team in two years? Who are they going to get to try and help him? 
but that that's all you talk about right now as you put a bow on their season and move on, and then he's not talked about anymore. So one of two things is – well, I guess one of three things is going to happen. The first is – he, he maxes out on the money. Right. He signs to stay in Oklahoma City and maybe dooms himself, if you will, to a life of this. Right. Of putting up huge numbers and never being on a championship it's caliber team. It's very difficult team. to say dooms in $209 million, but Correct. I completely understand what you're saying. Yes. Sort of like what Carmelo Anthony did. Right. Max out the money, live with the, the, right. the basketball ramifications. Option number two is, is he eventually leaves, right. and he leaves that door open. Option number three, which I would guess would be appealing to him, would be get enough help in Oklahoma City Mm -hmm. to have a chance to win a championship. And the name that jumps to mind, because he's an Oklahoma native, is Blake Griffin. Now, as Stephen A. told us yesterday, Griffin's injury might actually hamper that possibility. Griffin could opt out of his deal this offseason. Coming off another injury in the toe and everything else, maybe he doesn't opt out and he does stay and play another season in L.A. Maybe there turns into a trade scenario. We'll see. But... You figure if someone's going to go play with Russell in OKC, it's not going to be someone who has the ball in his hands all the time. No, no. Because Russell does. Russell does. So it's going to be a big. It's got to be a big. So Blake Griffin kind of makes some sense. It's got to be a big, and it's got to be a star. It's got to be a a star player, a great player. That's what's going to get them to compete, because other than that, they're they're not going to compete. Does that one make sense to you? I I do think that one makes sense, yes. The other name that will come up over the course of time will be DeMarcus Cousins, because he will be available, and, you know, that it feels like two sort of combustible in different ways personalities, in, 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 but, but you know, maybe you put them together and yeah, it turns out great. Who knows what it could turn into. I, I'm not sure either, but one way or another, I, 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 I stand and applaud Russell Westbrook. He, he, more than anyone else, made this NBA regular yep. season sensation. So, just, again, to put it on, he's under contract uh, next year, $28 million. Then he has a player option the year after that for $30 million. This summer, he is eligible to sign the five-year extension worth a projected $207 million. That would begin in 2018. Uh, and so, and as far as the team, Taj Gibson, Nick Collison, Norris Cole are all unrestricted free agents. So as you start to wonder you know, about that team and how it's going to kind of redevelop itself uh, to because that that is exactly it. You take the money and you are what you are, and you just say, "Okay, well, try as hard as we can." You know, I'll be the Tasmanian Devil every single year and give it my all, and we're only going to hit a, a you know a glass ceiling and have a tough time getting through it. Or he gets a lot of help, especially a star in there as well, to see if they can make a move. Greeny, you know how to win at business? Tell me how. Show up early for meetings. That way, everybody who's only on time looks like slackers. Well, I got a better way to win at business. What's that? Instant free nights at La Quinta Inns and Suites. You can show up with no advance reservation and redeem your La Quinta Returns loyalty points for a free night that same night just by using the La Quinta app. I feel like I'd win at business more than you. I'd cream you at business. Impossible. I'm undefeated at business. Go to LQ.com now and prepare to win at business. Here he is, our buddy Mark Schlereth, who's in our studio getting set to talk about the NFL draft and any number of other things because he's just sort of a debonair man about town. How are you, Stank? I am doing great. You're right. That never gets old. That always puts a smile to my face. has to. And it always surprises me. How do we describe who Derek Jeter is? Again, he's, he's, he's a married man now. They're going to have a baby, right, he and his right. beautiful wife, and that's wonderful. And so I'm, I'm sure she doesn't like it when people just rattle off the list oh, of names no, of women that no. he has dated. But for the record, because I assume some people don't know, Hembo sent it to me. He dated Minka Kelly, Tyra Banks, Adriana Lima, Scarlett Johansson, Mariah Carey, Jessica Alba, Jessica Biel, and that's just the ones we know about. Um, Wow. And he made two hundred and sixty-five million dollars playing baseball and won five World Series. And as you said, has never been you know on on a bad headline at all. Handled the locker room and the clubhouse in about as most professional way as you as you can. And now as an owner, part owner of a baseball team, I, I don't, I yeah. don't know how you describe. I just that. call him Jeets. <laughs> Jeets, w- winner. Yeah, yeah, I mean, in every way yeah. you can be a winner. He's a winner. Yeah. By the way, two quick uh, things to, from our previous uh, conversation, and then we'll dive into all this football with Stink. One of them is Mike. You mentioned the uh, um, investment that Jeffrey Loria made, yes. yes, and how much money he wound up making on the Marlins. He says that Buster sent me a note saying that may be number one, or this may be. Do you know that when George Steinbrenner originally bought into the New York Yankees, his uh, group's purchase of the team in 1973, his stake in that was $168,000. Forbes estimates this year the Yankees are worth $3.7 billion. 
So his family has w- turned out pretty well. Right. Works out okay as well. It's called yeah. pretty good ROI, right? It's pretty good. It's pretty good time to say thanks, Dad. Yeah, yeah. seriously, yeah. that worked out well. And I must correct myself. Jeffrey Luria did not go to Northwestern. You're trying to claim wrong. him, weren't you? I got that one wrong. Mm-hmm. Robert Lurie went to uh, Northwestern. Jeffrey Luria did not. Okay. How, so what? Now what investment did he oh, make? Oh, uh, I'll give yeah. it to you quickly. Please give it to me. In 1999, Jeffrey uh-huh. Luria bought a stake in the Montreal Expos for 12 mil. So yeah. 12 mil out of okay. his pocket. Right. 2002, Major League Baseball took over the Expos. They paid Loria $120 million to take over the Marlins. So they paid him $120 mm-hmm. mil to take over the Marlins. Okay. Now he's selling it for $1.3 bill. That's not a hey, listen. So twelve <laughs> went out of work. twelve went out of his pocket. pocket. One twenty came back to him yeah. from the league, and now one point three bill yeah, with so a B is going to uh, go to him. One hundred and eight. He made one hundred and eight million on that transaction, yeah, yeah. and then uh, now, yeah, good for him. Yeah. And by the way, good work. It's not like the investments I make. By the no. way, mine usually end up costing you know me what? money. Our portfolios look a little yeah. different. Yeah. Let yeah. the record show there is one person sitting at this table whose son once struck out Derek Cheater. And that one person is Mark Schneider. Yeah, there you go. Do you know Jeter's numbers against your son, Daniel? Uh, I would imagine they're pretty good because he always had him in a 3-2 count, and Jeter always fouled off about eight pitches in a row, and then got a, then he got a base hit over the second baseman's head, usually. Faced him four times. <laughs> right. Jeter was two for four in his career against yeah. Daniel, but did strike out once. So yeah. that's pretty good. Okay, wow. let's get back to business here. We have the uh, NFL draft, of course, begins tomorrow night. Uh, Adam Schefter tweeting this morning, the wheeling and dealing has begun. The Titans are open for business. They're looking to move back out of five. That's certainly no surprise. And there's also no surprise that the the Cavaliers, the Browns, are looking to have their cake and eat it too. They want to take Miles Garrett, the pass rusher extraordinaire, at number one. They have the 12th pick and two number twos where they can use to try and figure out a way to still get the quarterback, Mitchell Trubisky, that they want. Here's Mary Kay Cabot, who covers the Cleveland Browns. On the eve of the draft, I'm hearing that Miles Garrett and Mitch Trubisky are both still surprisingly in the conversation at number one in Cleveland. The coaches are all in on Garrett, and the front office is giving serious thought to Trubisky, even though he started only 13 games. Ultimately, I think the Browns will take Garrett first and then try to trade up for their fave quarterback. If they come away with their game changer both on offense and defense, everyone in the building will be happy. If they can't get Mitch, I believe they'll consider Deshaun Watson or Patrick Mahomes at number 12. Mike, what do you think? Well, I, 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 I understand what everybody's saying, that, that above the coaches want Trubisky, and I'm sure Hugh Jackson is trying to say what a mistake that will be if we don't take Miles Garrett. We need to take that guy number one. And then it's then you roll the dice. What move do we think? Do we think the Jets are going to take a quarterback at six? As I was saying earlier, Mark, now you're hearing – and eh, maybe they're not as high on a quarterback. But you have no idea what's true or not true at this point. Right. So do the Browns think they need to make a deal with Tennessee? We have the fifth pick and the 18th pick in the first round to try and at least get the five and say, okay, we're at least ahead of the Jets unless the Jets made a move uh, to try and get the quarterback that they want. As we know, I think you agree. Personally, I, I would not do this for uh, Trubisky or these quarterbacks trading up for them uh, to do this. But – as I said, we're not in that war room, and if that's the quarterback they think is going to be the man for them, then you've got to find a way to get him. But I do think you have to take Garrett first. You know, there's always this argument. Do you draft for need or do you draft best player available? And ultimately, all teams draft for need to a certain degree, right? right? They all yes. do. Now, here's the deal. When you're Cleveland and you have all the holes in your roster that you need to plug – you have to you have to go best player available. You know positions of need are always great, but you have to get the best players you can possibly get because you have a lot of holes to plug. Just like the 49ers have a lot of holes to plug, so you've got to go for the best players you can possibly get. And if on your board that Miles Garrett is the best player in college football, then that's the direction you have to go. If a quarterback falls to you, or if you want to climb up for a quarterback. That's your prerogative, but I, I just look at a team like the Cleveland Browns. You've got a lot of different things mm-hmm. that you've got to address. Um, you've got to go out and get the best players you can possibly get because this is a building process if you're the Browns. You're not one quarterback away from all of a sudden being good. I'm looking at Todd McShay's final draft 
rankings. So these are his final grades on all of these players. The, the process, which we have, have been talking about basically since January 1st, is over for all of these scouts, and it means it is as well in the building, right, for Mike, for all the teams, the general yes, managers. Yes. They have put their boards together, and so has Todd McShay, and he has concluded that the number one player in this draft is Miles Garrett. The number two player is Jamal Adams. Mike, who was the safety out of LSU Mm -hmm. that we loved. The number three player is Solomon Thomas, the versatile defensive Mm -hmm. lineman from Stanford. The number four player is Leonard Fournette, the running back out of LSU. So LSU had two of the top four players in college football, or at least uh, draft-eligible players, this year. Number five, Jonathan Allen out of Alabama. Number six, Marshawn Lattimore from Ohio State. Number seven, O.J. Howard, Mm -hmm. the tight end from Alabama. Number eight, Reuben Foster, the linebacker Alabama, who was just in our studio yesterday. Number nine, Christian McCaffrey, the sort of all-purpose back-slash-receiver-slash-return man out of Stanford. And number 10, Malik Hooker out of Ohio State. So those are the best players in this draft, according to Todd McShay. When do we get to a quarterback? It's a long way. Um... Let me go. I don't down mean you here. look down the list. The you know, first our... quarterback is Mitch Trubisky at number twenty-seven. Immediately behind him is Deshaun Watson at number twenty-eight. So that that if you obviously there are thirty-two picks in a round, so that would that right. would sort of right. net out to being a late first round. So that that again really yeah. just and I think that's a lot of people's grades like that. It just again goes to show how how the quarterback position is just it overvalued. Just gets, yeah, it, it just, just gets elevated. It it just, it just yeah. does, and and we we understand why because you really need a great one, but to to, to or at least close to a great one to get where you want to go. But then the question comes down to how much chance do you take if you're not sure? Right. You know, I mean, it's very difficult. The, the, the difficult part for me is you look at a, a Mitchell Trubisky and you say, yeah, that's our guy for the next 10 years. And you're trying to base that off of 13 games to be that right. sure of yourself to say, we're going to take him up there. That's why it's such a roll of the dice anyway with any player, let alone with the quarterback that you overvalue and, and draft higher than, than where their grade is. I, I just think it's, it's interesting. I was really, in the last collective bargaining agreement, I was really against the rookie wage scale. And for this, for many reasons. But one of the reasons is you're going to elevate these quarterbacks. You're going to elevate these guys because ultimately you're not really hurting yourself that much if this quarterback does not pan out. The other thing I was against, I was like, you guys are fools if you think that, uh, you know, we used to hang out at this place called Chilkoot Charlie's when I was growing up, you know, well, when I was of age. Right. And it was kind of a roughneck bar in Anchorage, Alaska. And their motto was, we cheat the other guy and pass the savings on to you. And I was like, if you think if you think the owners are going to stockpile money and pass it to veterans that they save on the young rookies, you guys are stupid, right? That's just dumb. Well, the one That's thing, never going to happen. The one thing I'll say on that side in the NFL with the, with, with the, the salary cap, they have to, there, there is a floor. They have to spend a the, minimum amount. Right. So they, they, so, they but can't it, really right. but it'll, lowball them. For, for me, it always goes to the, the six or eight guys that are right. that are the superior guys. You know, the right. quarterbacks, yes. the defensive yes. end that you can rush, you know, the wide receiver. Those are the guys. The cover corner, and then, right. You know, and then the other 80% of the guys are, you know, are, are fighting for, you know, right. the, the foot soldier money, like right. you said. But – uh, this is this is one where you can afford to overdraft a quarterback because ultimately it doesn't hamstring you for the next six years if he doesn't pan right. out. Mark Schlereth is here with the Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, half the cost. Lots going on this morning. We'll continue talking about the draft. And speaking of the draft, an early appearance this morning from Jason Stark with trivia today that is related. Good morning, guys. I know you're all honed in on that NFL draft. So in that spirit, here's a question about the baseball draft. Bryce Harper is one of four players taken with the first pick in the baseball draft who went on to win an MVP award in this century. Think you can name the other three? Good luck. All right, we have to clarify which century he means by this century. And now, insurance-minded speeches from GEICO. Let's talk about power. To illustrate this, allow me to tell you a story about how I moved a tow truck 25 miles using only my index finger. I was stranded with a flat tire. I opened the GEICO app. Then, with a few taps of my finger, I beckoned emergency roadside assistance and a tow truck to my car. I invite you all to unleash the full potential of your fingertips with the GEICO app. Thank you.
All right, we're Mike and Mike, and Jason Stark's Trivia is brought to you by Dove Men Plus Care. Did you know that 91% of guys that use new Dove Men Plus Care antiperspirant recommend it? So if you're heading to the gym right now, why not pick up some on the way? Mike and Mike and Mark Schlereth in our studio. Again, the trivia question from Jason Stark this morning. Bryce Harper is one of four players taken with the first pick in the baseball draft, who went on to win an MVP award in this century. Think you can name the other three? Good luck. So the first thing we did was, uh, because Jason's not with us this morning, so Hembo is going to be the arbiter of the answer, we confirmed that you don't have to have been drafted in this century. You just have to have won the MVP Mm -hmm. in this century, right? So, Mike, the first one is incredibly obvious. Yes, it is. A-Rod. All right, that, that one there was no yeah. question of. Thank God. We're, we're going to get at least 33% of this right, which was a lot of my time. Now, he, here's where it got complicated. Ken Griffey Jr. was the number one pick in the draft, and he certainly won MVP awards. But did he win one in this century go- or not? I'm going to say no, but I'm not positive. Okay, then I don't, right. I don't think he did either. So we're not going to give him because we have a couple of other choices. Here's what I can't remember. Was Chris Bryant the number one yeah. pick in the draft yeah. or not? He was a very high pick. Yes, he was. And he was the MVP last year. Stink, was he the number one pick in the draft? I don't rem- I just don't remember him being the number one pick in the draft, but that doesn't make me right. <laughs> right? I, don't, I just don't, the fact that I don't remember it. What do- in the interest of not belaboring this, we're right. going to guess Chris Bryant. Yeah. Ah! Okay. Yeah. Where was he? He was number two? number two. Number two. He was the number two number pick that two. year. Was Joe Maurer one of the answers? He oh, was. okay. Oh, right. So we had that yeah, right. we did have that one. It was the third one, Josh Hamilton. It is. Oh, yeah. we had all we the, had names, all the names. We I, that's, I went with the wrong one. We had them all. You know what? Down. I'm I'm actually pretty happy with our effort right there. Sixty six percent. Well. I guess we did. I we mean, did. Once you get one wrong, it Listen, really stops no, 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 mattering no, no. at we, that we, point. We, if, if we, now, in a regular test, we'd have had to write all the answers, and we'd have got the sheet back with two correct. And then, if there's a big cr- class, you grade on the curve, we're probably in the low 80s. You're, I'm good. <laughs> I, you I know agree. what we are? We're eligible. That's right. That's right. It's you know what? We're on the that's, field yeah, that, that is called majoring in eligibility, right, right there. Right. That's that is, but hey, D plus. They're not giving many of those away. Well, hey, you right? got a sixty six. Is the curve in yet? No. Yeah. Okay, we're good. Now we're I good. finally figured out the real difference between going to college as a football player and yeah. going to college as just a regular person. All right, Sports Center with Mike and Mike, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Other wireless providers say they'll cut your bill in half, but who knows what kind of coverage you're going to get with Straight Talk Wireless? You get nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE networks, and their no-contract unlimited plan is only $45 a month. Stink, as you have done the preparation that you have for this draft, is there a player or two that you have fallen in love with that you say, this guy is money in the bank and will be a really good NFL right. player for sure? I think, you know, there's there's a lot of guys in this draft. Um, I always really dig into the offensive lineman and the defensive lineman. It is harder now probably, and, and I get – I, I want Golik's opinion on this, to to evaluate defensive linemen because we talk about the spread offense and what it's done to the quarterback position. Offensive linemen in college football are not very good for the most part. Um and so why is, is it because they're just not being asked to do the things well, that you used to have to do in the NFL out, line? Right on an islands a whole lot more. Right. Maybe. Everything. But does that mean they're not? I guess I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but does that mean they're not very good or does that mean the system is making them doing the right? The system that, that is not making their game project well to the next level. They may play very well in college. Right. But as we talked about, when you go into the NFL, it's not the college's job to run a system to say, boy, I'm going to make this kid a good NFL player. Because remember, we talked about about that with Tebow. Yeah. Shouldn't shouldn't Urban Meyer be, be playing him in a way that he'll play better in the NFL? And the answer is absolutely no, not. Right. You do what you need to do to win at college. So is the college systems the way old linemen are playing, and we've heard this before, others say this as well, where they may look good on the college level, but when that type of game has to transfer to the NFL, that's where the fail, faltering comes in. Right. It's just it's it becomes really hard to evaluate defensive linemen because half the time they're just running through guys. Like uh, if you want to criticize a, a guy like Miles Garrett, well, Miles Garrett to me doesn't hasn't developed a secondary move. He hasn't had to. He just turns the corner and runs right. guys over, and so. There's no secondary move. So you go, well, I, you know, I, I watch him on film and I say, hey, he's got great awareness. He knows where the double teams are coming and all those things. But he's never really had a counter. He's never had to develop a counter move. So I look at that and it's hard to evaluate certain guys. I love Jonathan Allen. 
I think that guy's a great player. He plays across the line of scrimmage. Right. So he'll line up with the over the right tackle and the right guard and the left guard and the left tackle. He can play a five technique over the offensive tackle, come come down and play over the guard and a three technique. So I like the versatility there. You guys had on Foster the other day. The guy is just, I mean, he is phenomenal. Um, avoiding blocks, running to the point of attack, tackling people. He's great. There, there's, a, there's a lot of guys that I really like. It just becomes harder and harder to evaluate nowadays based on the college. And it's a good point. When your move works so well, like, like Miles Garrett turning the corner, it's like why, he didn't need another move for a lot, but he is going to have to get a second move. So we'll right. see, A, how much naturally that comes to you, and B, how that can be coached into him. It's a draft where people are very down generally on the offensive line. 